All right, engineers, what we're going to do in this video is we're going to talk about the hypothalamic and the pituitary axis. So if you look here at this diagram, first off, let's kind of get some anatomy straightforward here. If you look, I'm taking a piece of the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland out of this overall diagram here. So if you look here, I have the cerebrum, right, or the telencephalon. Then I have the cerebellum, midbrain, pons, medulla, spinal cord, right? What I'm doing is I'm taking this piece out right here where the hypothalamus and the mammillary bodies and the infundibulum and the posterior and anterior pituitary gland are, and we're zooming in on it. So again, this whole chunk of gray matter right here is the hypothalamus. This stalk part here that's connecting the hypothalamus to the actual pituitary gland is called the infundibulum. And then again, back here is gonna be the posterior pituitary gland. They also call it the neurohypophysis. And this one right here is going to be the anterior pituitary gland or the adenohypophysis. <clears throat> All right, first off, before we even get into anything real quick, I wanna make sure that we understand where this is actually situated. So you know this area right here, there's a, there's a bunch of nuclei that are actually kind of clustered together here, hypothalamus. Then you have what's called the thalamus right there. And then right back here, you're actually gonna have another part of it, which is gonna be the epithalamus, which is made up of the pineal gland and the habenula and habenular commissure and strium medullaris, whole bunch of different structures here that are making up the diencephalon. So he is, the hypothalamus is a bunch of gray matter nuclei situated anterior to the thalamus, right? Anterior and a little bit inferior to the thalamus. So now we know where the hypothalamus is. And again, the pituitary gland is hanging from the hypothalamus connected by the infundibulum. One more thing and then we're gonna go ahead and dive right in. If I were to zoom in a little bit more over here real quickly, I'm gonna say here's the hypothalamus, infundibulum. I'm gonna draw two components here. One is actually gonna be the posterior pituitary gland. The other one I'm gonna draw in blue, this is going to be the anterior pituitary gland. Now, why am I talking about this really quickly and why did I draw it another color? The posterior pituitary gland, the one in black here, that's actually gonna also be called the neurohypophysis, it's made up of neural tissue, okay? Or, or they also call it pituocytes, right? So again, it's made up of nervous tissue. This blue part right here, the anterior pituitary, or the adenohypophysis, is made up of a glandular cuboidal-like epithelial tissue. And it actually comes from the actual pharynx. So it comes from the mucosa of the pharynx. It's actually derived from a specific pouch called Rathke's pouch. Okay? So it actually is derived from the actual pharynx and it actually buds off from the pharynx and actually combines with the posterior pituitary to collectively form the anterior posterior pituitary gland or together we call the pituitary gland or another name for the pituitary gland is the hypophysis. Okay, so now that we got that straight, that's good. So again, we know that the anterior pituitary is glandular cuboidal epithelial tissue derived from the pharynx via what's called Rathke's pouch and we know that the posterior pituitary gland is actually neural tissue. It's made up of pituocytes, so it's not really even considered to be um, a separate type of gland. It's not really considered to be an endocrine gland, and it's actually a part of the actual brain, if you think about it, okay? Now that we've done that, let's go ahead and dive in. Let's first focus on the posterior pituitary gland and their hormones, and then we'll look at the anterior pituitary. So up here in the hypothalamus, there's some specific nuclei. What is a nuclei? Nuclei are gonna be a group of cell bodies, right? So in other words, this is the cell body here, and you might have dendrites coming off of it, right? So the group of cell bodies collectively together is called a nucleus in the central nervous system. And then there's what's called a tract. And a tract is a bundle of axons grouped together in the central nervous system. So in the hypothalamus, I have a bunch of nuclei situated all over the hypothalamus. We're gonna focus on very few of them. We're gonna focus on this one specifically first. So what is this blue nucleus called? This blue nucleus, is actually called the supra optic nucleus. So it's called the supra optic nucleus. So the supra optic nucleus is, an, is again a group of cell bodies collectively joined together in a specific area which is unmyelinated and it's actually going to be gray matter. This is called the supra optic nucleus. What does the supra optic nucleus do? It makes a specific hormone. And that hormone is actually gonna be carried down, this, what is this, this axon right here? 
It's traveled down the axon, it's transported down the axon by specific types of motor proteins. And as you transport the actual vesicles, down here is these little vesicles containing the specific hormone that's already been pre-synthesized. We're just waiting for a stimulus to release it. That hormone is called the antidiuretic hormone. So okay, now that we know that we're gonna secrete, what hormone are we making here? We're making antidiuretic hormone, also referred to as, shorthanded as, ADH. Sometimes they even call it another name. I'll write that one down too. It's also called vasopressin. So sometimes they also call it vasopressin. So again, superoptic nucleus is secreting a specific hormone called the antidiuretic hormone. But we said it's already been pre-synthesized. It's already formed and sitting in these little synaptic vesicles. Well, what triggers this supraoptic nucleus to produce action potentials that move down the axon and trigger the release of this hormone? Okay. One big thing that actually can trigger this effect here is, is actually going to be low blood volume. So one of the big ones is actually going to be low blood volume. All right. So one big thing is gonna be low blood volume. And if you have low blood volume, what else does that actually correlate with? It correlates with low blood pressure because volume is a direct indicator of pressure. So low blood pressure will be a very strong stimulus of these supraoptic nucleus here. Okay, what else? Another big, big, big one is the plasma osmolality, okay? So another one is the plasma osmolality, and specifically for this one, high plasma osmolality. High plasma osmolality. So what does this mean by high plasma osmolality? Well, osmolality is referring to basically the concentration of solute inside of the plasma and water. So it's the concentration of certain types of electrolytes and solutes and water inside of our blood plasma. The higher the plasma osmolality, the less water there is, the more hypertonic it is. The lower the plasma osmolality, what's that mean? That means that it's actually gonna be hypotonic. So if it's, again, if it's high plasma osmolality, that means that there's a lot of solutes, very little water, it's hypertonic. If it's a low plasma osmolality, what does that mean? That means that there's a lot of water and less solutes. So if there's a high plasma osmolality, that means that there's very little, low water, high solutes. Okay, this supraoptic nucleus actually has specific things called osmoreceptors that are situated around it. We're not gonna talk about those. They're, that's why it be called uh, the subfernicular organ and the organovasculosum of laminar terminalis. They're basically osmoreceptors that pick up the plasma osmolality. Whenever it's high, it's gonna stimulate this guy to send action potentials down and release ADH. One other stimulus that's another important one is also pain. So pain also has the ability to activate the production of antidiuretic hormone. Now, once we've produced this antidiuretic hormone, it's gonna go and exert its effects on two different target organs that we'll talk about individually in another video, okay? But again, one more time, pain can stimulate the supraoptic nucleus, low blood pressure or low blood volume, and a high plasma osmolality, which means low water, high amounts of solutes, right? And who can pick up that change in osmolality? The osmoreceptors, like the subfernicular organ or the organovasculosum of lamina terminalis. And then we're stimulated, it sends the action potentials down the axon and sends this actual release of antidiuretic hormone out. All right, and then it's gonna go affect its target organs. What can inhibit? So we know it stimulates it, what can inhibit it? One thing that can inhibit it is the opposite effect. So if you have what? High blood pressure. If you have low plasma osmolality, what else is another really big one? Alcohol. So another really, really big effector of this is alcohol. Alcohol actually has a inhibitory effect on ADH. Okay, so it has an inhibitory effect on ADH. And again, what other things could have an effect here? Like I said, it could be high blood pressure. So I'll put high BP or low plasma osmolality, which I'm denoting here as PO, okay? So again, high blood pressure, low plasma osmolality, and alcohol are some very strong inhibitors of antidiuretic hormone. Okay, now that we've done that, let's move on to the next one. 
What is this nucleus that's situated right here called? This one is called the paraventricular nucleus. Okay, so what is this one called here? This is called the paraventricular nucleus. And both of these are actually paraventricular nuclei. This one is, and this one is. So again, these, could, these two could actually be having their axons combined. So I could actually draw from this guy, I could actually say that these two axons are actually combining here. And when they combine, they form again, what's that called? A tract. Okay, so these two guys could be combining here. All right, so the paraventricular nucleus, it has these axons that extend all the way from the hypothalamus to the actual posterior pituitary. And it releases a very, very specific hormone in response to that. Because same thing like ADH, the hormones are stored in these synaptic vesicles in the axon terminal. So they're already preformed and synthesized. We just need a stimulus to cause the release. So again, what's this hormone that's being released over here? This is called oxytocin. Okay, so we call it oxytocin. So oxytocin is a very, very important hormone that again, we'll talk about its effects in an individual video and all of its tar target organs. But let's just say what stimulates his release. He's stimulated, he stimulates these neurons here. So let's say what stimulates this guy here. So what stimulates here? Let's actually do this in green so we can see it here. So let's say we have here what stimulates this nucleus. What's a stimulator of that nucleus? A stimulator of this nucleus is usually going to be the birthing process. So one big thing is the birthing process. And like I said, I'll explain this in more detail when we talk about it in an individual video. So the birthing process is a really, really big one. Another really big effector of it is actually going to be suckling. So when the baby is actually suckling on the mother's uh, mammary glands, or specifically the areola, it's actually suckling on the nipple, it can activate specific receptors that will send the actual release of oxytocin. Another thing is actually going to be for the male sexual ejaculation response. So it's also responsible for ejaculation. So all of these things are very, very strong stimulators of oxytocin. And again, what are they? The birthing process? suckling and ejaculation. And again, we'll talk about these in more detail, but again, what happens, stimulates the paraventricular nucleus, he sends action potentials down, calcium rushes in, and stimulates the release of oxytocin. So again, posterior pituitary hormones are oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone are also called vasopressin. All right, now that we've done that for the posterior pituitary, let's go ahead and look at the actual hormones released by the anterior pituitary in a deeper way. So over here, you're gonna notice, what do I have here? I have a nice vasculature, I have a blood vessel. A blood vessel connection, a vascular connection between who? Between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary gland. Whereas, over here in the posterior pituitary, what was connecting the hypothalamus to the posterior pituitary? These axons. So there's a neural connection. Now we need to define what is this neural connection right here that's extending all the way from the hypothalamus to the actual posterior pituitary. What is this neural connection called? This neural connection is called the hypothalamic, all right, hypophyseal tract. Okay, so let's define that again. Let's basically work these words out. Hypothalamic, it's coming from the hypothalamus to the hypophyseal, what does that mean? The hypothesis, hypothesis is another word for the pituitary gland, right? So it's going from hypothalamic, hypophyseal, it's a tract, what is a tract? It's a bundle of axons in the central nervous system. So again, this connection that's connecting the hypothalamus to the posterior pituitary gland is called a hypothalamic hypophyseal tract, which is a nerve connection. All right, whereas over here, if you notice these part of the, there's like a capillary bed on this side, there'll be a capillary bed down on this side, and there's a portal vein connecting it. We say, by definition, whenever there's two capillary beds connected in series between an intermediate portal vein, this is called a portal system. Well, it's a portal system for what? The hypothesis. So this right here is called the, what's this portal system here called? This is called the hypophyseal portal system. And again, what is the hypophyseal portal system? It is again, gonna be two capillary beds. This is the primary capillary plexus. 
This one down here is the secondary capillary plexus, and they're connected in series through an intermediate portal vein. And what's that portal vein called? The hypofacial portal vein.